What's going on, everybody? My name is Danny, aka Captain Sin, and this is Chatting with Captain, recorded live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash the Captain Sin. Our guest today is the vocalist for 18 Visions, James Hart. How's it going? What's up? Uh, it's going well. I appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Um, first question I always ask everybody What is the first album from your childhood, teenage years that still sticks with you? today and inspires you to this day from my childhood teenage years fuck man uh it's an easy one alice in chains dirt nice yeah that one kind of like for me it's my favorite record of all time um just has a lot of like influence in me um musically uh and it's just one of those albums that like, I feel like at a young age, I, I instantly connected to, mm -hmm. uh, on all levels, musically, lyrically, it was dark. Um, and then, you know, 42 years old now still hits me just the same. I still have that like same connection to the album that I did when I was, when I was a youngin. Mm. Have you, uh, have you heard them lately with their new singer? What do you think about that? Yeah, I've seen them uh, multiple times. Mm. We uh, we played a festival, I think it was back in 2006, before we had split up, uh, and they were the headliner. I was just so jacked uh, to see them. I never saw them with Lane Staley, and it was before the the Black Gave Way to Blue album came out, mm. and I thought it was I thought it was insanely good. Um, I loved everything about the show. I thought it was great. I thought he was I thought he was good. Uh, the album that came out, the first one, thought it was awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, the second one they did with them, The Devil Put the Dinosaurs There, they, it had some bangers on it, but it wasn't as solid from front to back as as, uh, as Black Gives Way to Blue. And then uh, Rainier Fog, the last one they did, I saw them on that tour, and that was fucking killer yeah. show. Um, so, some bangers on that one, too. Uh, but you know, it's, they're all, they're all slightly a little bit different from each other, right, which right, is, right. I, which I like that though. Oh yeah, of course. I saw them with, uh, they played, they did a tour with corn a couple years back. That was super sick. So sick. They are like, I saw them on their first tour back, Alice in Chains, and it was, it blew me away. It's so good. The yeah, fact that they can still, they still bring it after all these years. Absolutely. And it's still Jerry writing all the music. So yeah, I mean, yeah. That's yeah, a big, gonna be that's good. a huge part of it. Absolutely. And um, I know you're a big him fan too. Huge. Huge. Did yeah. you hear um, Villa's solo album that came out last year? I did. It's yeah. super sick. Yeah, loved it. When, yeah. Did, when did you get into him? So I got into that band, had to have been 2001, mm. I would say. I was getting tattooed. And this dude uh, that was tattooing me at the time put Razor Blade Romance on. Mm -hmm. And so that was like my first introduction introduction to them. And I thought it was super cool. At the time, I just thought it was like a, a poppier, like kind of like typo negative on the first listen. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, the more acquainted I got with the band, to me, it felt more like a like a gothic like neil diamond <laughs> so like for me there's like a neil diamond black sabbath like typo negative and like billy idol influence in there which fucking all oh, of, yeah. all of that stuff rips so i thought i thought it was like really really cool um and then i just kind of obsessed over the band i started collecting like all of the music and then in 2004 somehow some way we opened up for them on their first ever u.s oh, wow. tour and that was pretty <laughs> fucking amazing that had yeah. to have been crazy i never got to see them yeah. live i still to this day i'm still pissed at myself for never seeing them live oh it yeah sucks so great. bad and then i went and saw them uh on the farewell tour in mm. la and uh in anaheim that would have been insane yeah it was great i know the first the first album that i was able to find was razor blade romance but I didn't really get into them until like the whole, you know, bam, Margera thing happened and it exploded at that point. But sure that I had every one of their albums. I don't, I don't know what a favorite album of theirs would be. Honestly, like they every album has bits that are all good. So it's really hard to like pick a favorite from them for me, I would say. 
Yeah, for me, it's Deep Shadows. Um, I feel like that's kind of always been my favorite from them. It's mm. got my favorite songs on it. Um, front to back, I feel like I never, I never get tired of it. I never get bored with it. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, when did you really get into fitness? Like, when did you really start getting into it? Because I know here lately you've been really, really getting into it. So yeah, like. I would say uh, I was always really athletic growing mm. up. In high school, I played sports. Um, I was always one of the more athletic kids on my teams. Um, usually was like the fastest in terms of speed. And I was always like really, really competitive with like my teammates and like, you know, other players that were kind of, you know, in Little League and you know, football growing up and stuff like that. So I, I was kind of like set those best players as my, my bar, my competition and wanted to, you know, be better than the next guy. And then in, in high school, I just, I kind I, I found punk and metal and I kind of fell out of sports, you know, I kind right. of, kind of, kind of got out of it. Um, and then I would say when I was about 20, years old 21 me and a bunch of friends just started lifting weights again and it was just we there'd be like 10 of us in there and we'd have a var we'd have a varsity bench and a junior varsity bench and <laughs> you know just different weights going on and uh fucking m shadows from avenge was oh, nice. was in there and it, it's funny because at the time like you know he's a big dude right oh, yeah, like, he's huge. <laughs> so at, at the time though he was like on the jv bench which is which is funny um you know, to see him now. Uh, so I, I guess like it kind of started around then and maybe, you know, two years ago, I wanted to like challenge myself and get like super fit. Mm. You know, my diet wasn't necessarily intact and, you know, it's just kind of been more of a focal point for me. And um, I've been working with a trainer out of the UK for the last 10 weeks on a 12 week program, just to kind of take things up, you know, another level. And, you know, being in my early 40s, I just want to stay fit and healthy mm -hmm. and, you know, feel good. Um, I feel like I've, I've, you know, I've been training, you know, consistently for, you know, a, a decade now, but never really had it all completely put together right, right. so it's like not training super hard or not eating super good and just it wasn't all like working together so i never was like reaching my full potential which is where i'm trying to go now nice yeah um when did you decide that you wanted to be straight edge uh i think when i was 14 when i mm. kind of found out what it was um i was into punk and some metal uh like my my first exposures to punk were like minor threat early green day early bad religion early no effects gorilla biscuits mm -hmm. um and for metal it was like you know metallica megadeth slayer stuff like that and i was listening to a lot of minor threat and kind of like listening to the lyrics and didn't really know what it was about got into high school met some friends that were straight edge and found out that like, that's kind of what minor threat was. And that's kind of what gorilla biscuits was back in the day. And I had never done any drugs or anything. Uh, it's never smoked, never drank. And I grew up, uh, younger than being even a teenager with alcohol, alcoholism in my family. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think, uh, playing sports and being so focused on like, you know, being fit and a competitor that kind of kept me out of it in my early high school years. Mm. And then I think after that, it was more or less not wanting to be like the, like the person or people that were, uh, you know, had those addictions and vices in my family. Mm. Right. And I just held on to it. It just, a part it just became a part of who i am like people talk to me about you know do i ever want to drink or have i ever thought about it and it's like no it's just like 
it's not even an, an afterthought. It's, it doesn't ever, doesn't ever pop into my brain. It's, you know, straight edge to me, it's just now it's a part, it's a part of me. You know, right, it's right. not like, it's not like this tangible thing or this label that I slap on myself. Um, even though I call myself straight edge proudly, it's just, it's totally become a part of me at this point in life. Right. Yeah, I would, I would say like, it seems like when most people are like, they start young in those thoughts, they never really like want to try drugs or anything like that. Like as long as it's early on in life, you actually get those beliefs and everything that usually the, the temptation just isn't there. Yeah, no, it's not. And especially if you've got like a group of friends around you that are also like-minded mm. and those, that group of friends stays like-minded with you mm. throughout the course of, of your, you know, your teenage years and your early to mid twenties. And you, you've got that core group, uh, which I did and still have, uh, you know, I, I think, the 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 temptations aren't brought into it you don't have you know i i actually did i had two two groups of friends uh one group that you know ended up did and did end up getting into alcohol and some pretty hard drugs mm -hmm. and then the other group that was playing music and you know you know straight edge and still living that lifestyle and i just kind of with what i was doing with my life at the time going to school working a job playing in a band and, you know, wanting to make time for my friends, the extra time was going towards, you know, the group of people that were in the bands and that were more of like, you know, kind of like a positive, you know, influence and had a positive outlook on life. Um, and so I just gravitated towards that. Nice. Well, that, um, well, the straight edge, did that lead you into the hardcore scene? Do you think? Uh, yeah, I think for me, I kind of, found them hand in hand mm. um the first hardcore show i went to was um gosh 1994 maybe i think mm. it was integrity and like 108 nice. um i think is what it was and that's the first time i ever put x's on my hands i think that's the first time i like you know, decided to declare myself straight edge. Mm. Um, and at that point, I feel like it was hand in hand for me. Uh, and then as I got older, especially in my early to mid thirties, um, as I started touring, you know, a lot with 18 visions and then the band breaking up and then touring a lot with my other band burn halo, mm which was a, a total different vibe. Um, we were out touring with all rock bands. Uh, you know, I was gone so much that I kind of like, I guess, lost sight of what was going on in the hardcore community and like bands and like tours that were coming through. And I mean, just to be honest, you miss a lot of tours in general when you're oh, in a touring band, right? 100%, so, yeah. um, yeah, I wasn't as like keen or hip to like what new bands were coming out. And then I think when I, uh, when I quit that band in 2000, beginning of 2016, I, I was home. Mm -hmm. I was able to kind of dive back into the hardcore scene and start to find these like new bands that I thought were fucking cool and kind of like rejuvenated my, you know, love for, you know, metal and hardcore, I would say. Mm -hmm. Would that be the, um, I know you, uh, 18 visions went from like the hardcore sound to more of, I guess you could call it hard rock, I guess labels. I hate labels. So, uh, but then the, the new stuff is back to the hardcore. Does that have anything to do with that? Uh, no, not at all. I think, uh, you know, for, for people that don't know, like how the band kind of reformed, uh, Keith had approached me, um, in 2016 and at that point i didn't have anything musically going on and we had tried to reform 18 visions twice once in 2012 and once in 2014 i think mm. and it just never panned out but we had written some songs together keith and i and so he asked me if i wanted to you know finish some of the songs that he had lying around so i said sure um started demoing out some songs with him he started sending me more music we started working on that. Um, we had asked Trevor and Ken if they wanted to be involved. Ken 
uh, Ken declined based on his workload. Hmm. Uh, Trevor was in. So we just started getting together and writing and recording new songs. And we wanted to do something that was heavy. Hmm. And I would say halfway through the process, I kind of brought up, you know, what we're going to call the band, you know, mm-hmm. and the whole 18 visions things was, was a little touchy because Ken wasn't involved and Ken was a founding member with me. Right. And he, he wrote a lot of the music, um, with Keith. So I had asked Keith, well, Hey, you know, would you want to play 18 vision songs live? And he said, yeah, of course, you know, and I was like, all right, well, you know, these songs sound like 18 vision songs. <laughs> so if we don't call this 18 visions, we're only fooling ourselves based on what we want to do. Right. And I think that kind of put everybody at like ease. It's like, yeah, kind of, this is what this is. So uh, at that point we wanted to uh, knowing what it was going to be, I think co- like write a, write a collective album of, you know, each album and what we loved about each album, you mm. know, the, uh, you know, the until the ink stuff, the vanity stuff, the obsession stuff, and then the self-titled stuff and kind of like combine all of that into one album. And then as we started doing that, uh, we realized that we really, really, really liked what we were doing with the heavy stuff. And then when we went out and played um, those songs, playing the old songs with some of the newer heavy stuff felt great and playing, you know, some of the, or rehearsing through some of the, you know, maybe poppier stuff Mm. or more rock stuff didn't feel quite as good. Didn't feel quite as fun. And then when we did the last EP, we definitely decided that like, Hey, we want to make stuff that's like really, really heavy. This is Mm. what we love. This is who we are. This is like what the band is. And this is what we love playing live. Right. Would you say the hardcore shows are more fun? Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're very, very different, but they've got right. like an they've just an unrivaled energy to yeah. you know a hardcore show versus a rock show. Right. It's unrivaled. Yeah. Hundred percent. Especially like you know having kids jumping up on stage with you the whole time and just the whole everybody's just in one vibe. Yeah. Hundred percent. Um, do you have any like do you do any collecting or anything of any kind? So yeah, I recently got back into collecting vinyl. Nice. Um, I had a really killer collection uh, in my teenage, early 20 years, and I parted with almost all of it. I just, for whatever reason, I just, it was taking up space and I was moving around and just kind of never home. And it was just sitting there. I sold some of it. I gave some of it away stuff that I will never get back again. Um, I mean like absolute, like, you know, diamonds, gems that are just would be at this point worth more to me now than a price tag, you know, that I'll just never, I'll never see again. Right. And then when we, you know, we got back together and we started, you know, reissuing vinyl, and starting to have fun with that, I was like, this is really cool. And I started just kind of collecting, um, you know, stuff that friends were putting out. And then I, then I wanted to start to go after my old collection again. So I've just been slowly, slowly building that. It, the big, the big difference is paying, you know, <laughs> a shit ton more, <laughs> ten ten dollars for an LP uh, back in like 1996 and now it's a hundred dollars or yeah. something, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. The price tag is definitely much steeper. It's like, it seems like not just with vinyl cause vinyl is huge again, but it seems like retro in general seems like it's coming back now. I don't know if it's because there's just really no originality anymore or if people just like having a physical thing. Yeah, I think that's just it, man. I think, I think obviously CDs are obsolete, right? Mm-hmm. And like that, that was the physical copy for the last 20 years, right? Like you, you had a CD and bands weren't really releasing vinyl at, like as much over the last 20 years. I mean, you had bands like Converge and stuff that were, mm-hmm. you know, consistently doing that and making it a collector's item. Um, but I feel like, the record labels, the cost of producing vinyl got more expensive. 
uh, the amount of collectors diminished and, you know, vinyl is much more expensive to produce now than it was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Mm. So I think, um, I think now that CDs are obsolete, uh, you, you print or press, uh, you know, a limited quantity of something and make it special so that, you know, a real collector is going to have one out of a thousand or one mm. out of 10,000 units, whatever, whatever that, um, whatever that threshold is. Um, and it just makes it more special, you know, mm. I like the, uh, like the clear colored vinyls that people have been doing lately. And then there's just like all sorts of different, like the actual vinyl itself is completely different. Um, how hard is that to like get going for a band? Yeah. So for us, it's been fairly easy. Um, so we, we got back the rights to our trust kill catalog nice. and, um, the first reissue was done through Good Fight. That was the Until the Ink. Um, and so we kind of had like a, a limitless uh, ability to do whatever we wanted with the artwork and with the vinyl. And we didn't really know what we were getting into with different variants and stuff. So we just made one variant and it was super, super fun to do. We we're super excited about it. And then we reissued Vanity ourselves, um, was that maybe last year? And so that was fun because we we made things more limited. We started to mess with the the vinyl variants and the you know the different colorways. And so that was fun. And then we on the EP kind of got even a little, you know, a little more crazy and you know decided to do a 10 inch, which is super <laughs> rare. And for us, it was just about like, we're, so we're fully self-funded. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so for us, it's just about having a, a credit card and being able to pay, you know, the, um, the deposit right. and then the ba the balance on delivery. And then once, you know, that's paid for is a, a credit card balance for a week or two. And then we put it up, put it up on sale and, you know, ship everything out ourselves, and, right. you know, you know, recoup that money. And yeah, it's, it's fairly, fairly easy for us. Do you like doing everything yourself better than being with a label? hundred percent. Right. Especially, especially at this point, like the band for us is not about generating uh, a, a ton of money. It's not about generating uh, an entirely new fan base. Uh, it's not about going out and touring, you know, eight to 10 months a year. For us, it's all about fun and having mm. fun with it. And that is, you know, all the way from writing the music to rehearsing to recording to uh, the artwork to conceptualizing the vinyl to the merchandise and shipping it all out. Even the shipping, which is like uh, it's it's a bit of a burden because you mm. get 500 orders in at once. Right. When right. you, when you drop something new, but there's something that is like cool about it where you're connecting to these, these people and these fans in different cities and different States in different countries. I'm sending vinyl and merchandise to countries. I never would have thought, you know, we would have, you know, a fan or some sort of fan base. Mm -hmm. And so there's something like really, really cool about having that connection to, you know, what, what you're doing and connecting with these people, um, that never have, I don't think I've ever felt before. Um, uh, and you know, I feel like the, the labels at this point, it just kind of takes some of that fun away. It, uh, it, it puts, a, an unwanted, I think, pressure or expectation on us to do certain things, to play a certain amount of shows, to, do these tours and that's just not where we're at. This is purely about fun and having fun with everything we do. And I think that as long as we're doing that, we'll probably be able to do this for a while. Right. Do you think labels will ever become obsolete? Um, you know, uh, I would say not entirely. Hmm. Um, especially for, the you know the bigger like platinum multi-platinum right, right. selling artists mm -hmm. there's just there's just too much there i think 
for for them. Um, but you know, it'd be interesting to see somebody uh, that sells, you know, that that would sell in a normal CD purchased era. Somebody that sells five million copies of an album in the U.S. and see what they would do if they, you know, wanted to do things on their own. That would be right. That would be interesting. But I think. I just think for the smaller bands too, that actually do want to go out and tour a bunch. I think that there's, there's something to having some marketing behind you Mm -hmm. and some promotion and not having a full financial burden of like touring fall on you where you're making a hundred bucks a night and you're not Mm -hmm. able to pay the gas. You know, you get that tour support a little bit from the label the label might probably gets more in return with a 360 deal or something. But I think that there's definitely a, a benefit to having a label for some bands. Right. Um, do you think that the internet has just completely changed the music industry at this point? I mean, yeah, it's hard to say that it hasn't. Right. Um, I mean, it started, uh, what was that? Probably I mean, when was Napster 20 years ago? I would say like 2000, 2001, I think is when, yeah. the, when the shit yeah. hit the fan with that. Yeah. So, I mean, that was it. That was like the turning point, right? That's when like the downloads started coming. That's when album still sales started dropping. Um, yeah, I think it has a, 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 I think it's had a huge like negative impact. Um, also has had a huge positive impact. Mm-hmm. You know, bands are able to self-promote, self-market. Uh, there's different resources that weren't available 20 years ago, you know, uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago that are now uh, connecting with fans on a personal level, um, you know, interchanging messages, reacting to uh, content. Mm. So, I mean, that's the positive takeaway from it, right? right. The negative is, is the free, right? Yeah, and yeah. The, the entitlement of an individual to say, I should be able to have this record for free, right? Mm-hmm. You don't walk into somebody's place of business. You don't walk into an art gallery and say, Hey, I want that picture or I want that painting. I'm just going to walk out with it. It's because it's free, right? right? Like it just music, music to me is art. And, you know, not that, you know, I mean, you get starving artists, right? But Mm -hmm. everybody should be, I feel like, um, recouped for what they're putting into it right of course so you get original music original art uh whether it's photography sculpting uh paintings it's all like somebody's passion and heart poured into something Mm. and you're just taking it because you feel like you can or yeah you don't need to pay for it right so that's uh that's the shitty part about that um what do you think of the trend of bands just releasing singles and not going for full albums uh i think it's cool um i i like the idea of so my buddy greg um he uh sings for uh dillinger escape plan the black Mm -hmm. queen and uh killer be killed he's got his own solo thing going i think what he did with his solo album was really fucking cool where he was releasing singles but then releasing like a limited quantity of vinyl as those singles. Oh, nice. Right? So those singles became a collector's item, right? Mm -hmm. So they're available to stream, but also if you want the physical copy, which is even more limited than the LPs, uh, you have that. And I think that that is a really fucking cool idea and making those singles a part of the full length or the LP and then releasing that later on down the road whenever you're ready for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, just kind of throwing out songs uh, for streaming. I mean, it's cool if it's a collaboration or something, but right. I'm, you know, I'm not really into the whole idea of just like throwing out a song here and there just because. Mm-hmm. If there's a greater picture or a grand scheme of what it's going to be, a part of an EP, a part of a full length, then I, you know, I'm all for that. But mm-hmm. um, there's just something I think. I feel like it maybe waters water sinks down a little bit more and when those songs don't become a part of something bigger um when that something bigger is released uh you know 
it, it might not feel as good. And I know a lot of pop artists just kind of throw songs out there and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. And if it hits, then they'll put it on the LP or the album. If not, then it's just a one-off. And mm -hmm. that's just, uh, yeah, not really my vibe. I'm right. more of an album guy. You know, oh, I yeah. grew up listening to, I, I had to listen to cassettes and, <laughs> you know, having to fast forward or rewind through a song was a pain in the ass. So you just yes. listened all the way through, yep. you know? So I'm an album guy. 100%. Um, what do you think it is about 18 Visions that has kept everyone around all these years, all the fans? <sighs> Man, I don't really know, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, to be fair, you know, from album to album there, we were changing quite a bit, right? Right. And so I think we did a really good job of alienating a lot of fans, which wasn't our intent, um, but it definitely happened. And, you know, we pissed a lot of people off. But, you know, for us, we never wanted to, I think, make the same album twice. We were always, mm -hmm. you know, evolving and, you know, trying to bring new ideas and new influences and inspirations into our music uh, with each album. And I feel like each album was a really good reflection of kind of what we were listening to or what we were doing at that time. Nothing was ever forced. Um, but it was it was definitely a reflection of of who we were in that moment, and so I I think uh, I think coming back and uh, maybe taking the approach we did to you know the new music and 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 putting you know a really pure uh, version of ourselves in 2017 out there and again in 2020 out there I think really you know, told people like, Hey, you know, this band is like embracing like who they are or what mm. they were and, you know, accepting that in the modern era, not trying to change things around a whole lot. And to be fair, we've also pissed off fans with the 2017 release and the new release because we gained so many fans with the self title from 2006 right. that when the band came back, they were excited. And all of a sudden, the first track is, you know, blast beats and crazy <laughs> <It is fun. laughs> screaming. They're just like, what the fuck is this? You know? Right. And then they listen to the whole album and maybe they're only picking two songs that they like. And then we put the EP out and it's like, absolutely not for them at all because the same thing, it opens with like a fucking blast beat and right. like a crazy scream. <laughs> right. So yeah. But yeah, we, again, like we just, we don't care. We want to be ourselves and we want to be honest with ourselves and, you know, and, 2021 we're writing music for ourselves and and we want to be happy with it and i think when you're happy with it i think everybody you know and it's a, it's a pure it's in its pure form it's not forced it's not for this label it's not for the radio it's not for that it's just for you the mm -hmm. band then the people connect for that and then it becomes for the fans and for the people and i think that that's why you know we've been able to be where we're at right now you can tell like a lot of times you can just tell when an album is forced for the most part because the passion just isn't there, I think. And then 100%. Um, doing the whole uh, albums differently thing, I know Avenged Sevenfold did the same thing. Like every one of their albums has been different as well, and they're still going with it, just doing what they love to do. And I think every band should just be doing that, whether or not, you know, I, I understand that a lot of bands don't want to take that leap because they don't want to lose fans. But at the same time, like if you have a passion for it, just do it. hundred percent, man. I, I mean, I respect bands that are willing to take those like courageous leaps mm. and, you know, m you know, kind of make those transitions. Um, you know, as long as they're being honest with themselves. Mm. Right. And it's not, it's not for a cash grab or it's not forced. Uh, cave in for me is, a, is one of the best examples of, you know, a band doing that in a really, really, really great way. And uh, for me, I loved everything that they put out up until Antenna. Uh, I thought that was a great album. But I also, I was able to kind of take the, the, the transition and, and I understood what was going on from the Creative Eclipses EP to, you know, Jupiter and, and everything on after that. It, it, it made sense to me as a listener. So I wasn't I wasn't upset when I, when I heard creative eclipses, mm. um, after, you know, until your heart stops being one of my still probably my favorite, like metalcore album of all time, um, or one of them at mm. least. Um, 
I wasn't upset about it. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't disappointed, but also I, I had a very, and still have a very like broad love of music where I, I'm not like handcuffed to a, a certain genre. Right. So. Right. I know that that's a big thing that like, a lot of people are just like, Oh, well this album isn't breakdowny enough and they're not tuned low enough and they sold out and blah, blah, blah. Did you guys have any, um, I guess, apprehension about changing your sound back in the day? I don't think so. I think we just went with it. You know, mm. I don't think, no, because we were, we were, uh, I think with Obsession, we were still writing in a rehearsal space, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and Vanity, we for sure were. So Vanity, we were just showing up with riffs and kind of putting together like a jigsaw puzzle and none of it made sense. And looking back, like, you know a lot of those songs like don't make sense Son <laughs> sonically it's just part after part after part after part and me just trying to sing over everything because i'm like oh fuck that part's cool i want to sing over that part oh that riff's fucking badass i want to sing over that um and then with obsession i think the same thing it was just bringing ideas and nobody said hey this is too weird mm -hmm. um and then the self-titled album uh, at that point, Ken and Keith were definitely doing the demoing on their own. I think they were they were probably using uh, like Pro Tools or something at the time and sending music around. And I don't think anybody ever really said like, no, this can't work, right? Mm -hmm. I always, my outlook on everything was, this is really cool. I love this. Um, this doesn't sound like 18 Visions right now, but if my voice is on it, it might sound like 18 visions. Right. And I think that that's always the approach that I kind of took. And I, yeah, I think we just never wanted to like, really like really shoot down creative ideas, especially, especially if they were bringing like new elements into the band, it mm -hmm. was always fun to bring something new into the, and fresh in. Um, I don't think we ever wanted to regurgitate old music. Right. Right. And I think with all of the, you know, Keith and Ken were very, very different in their musical influences. Um, and I think that that's what made things so great is the rock bands that Keith listened to weren't necessarily some of the rock bands that Ken was, was listening to. And, you know, those, those elements getting brought in just made things really fucking cool. Right. Nice. Um, when did you first get into tattoos? Was that like the hardcore scene as well? Yeah, I was 15, started making bad decisions around <laughs> then, you know. Uh, my first one was, God, I was like on the inside of my, my, my leg. I was 15, a dude, this, he was straight edge at the time, this kid, he had like a homemade tattoo gun. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and he did like these three little X's on the inside of my leg that were just blown out. And then he covered that up like a year later with like a sacred heart, which was even more blown out. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just got this fucking black blob on there waiting to get lasered off. But uh, yeah, I started getting tattoos when I was 15. Uh, a lot of bad decisions. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're a part of me, but I, I think I look at my friends now that are in their like mid to late thirties that are still getting sleeves. And I'm like, fuck, that looks so good. Like, right. And my shit looks <laughs> fucking tired. You know, <laughs> I, I like for me, when I first got into tattoos, it was literally, it was good. Charlotte avenged and you guys Oh, sick because it was like, those were the, the, I guess the main bands at the time that I was getting into because I'd first heard uh, Waking the Fallen in like 2003, 2004, and that started getting me down the path. But I discovered you guys through a video game. Uh, which one? Uh, ATV Off-Road yeah. Fury for PSP. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah that's when I first found 18 Visions. I was like, holy shit, this is sick. And then that just that's how I dove down the rabbit hole was that game. Yeah, that's awesome. How did that come about? Do they just like approach you about that, or how does that work? Yeah, I think uh, I I think we had either like a like a publishing mm. company or the label that was like kind of sending music out 
to different like video games and trying to get placements and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah. Are you are you a big gamer? No, no. Um, I was an avid Madden player. Oh yeah. Up until about six years ago. Mm. And then I just started, I don't know what happened. I think I just started dedicating my free time to watching uh, like television series. Mm. What's your favorite and, series? Uh, my favorite of all time is probably Game of Thrones. Mm. Uh, what I will say is the best of all time is Breaking Bad. Oh, nice. So they're not necessarily one in the same for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I gravitate to one because of the, you know, the period and, you know, the actors and the story and stuff like that. But in terms of like what's done better, uh, it's Breaking Bad. It's not even close. Uh, I will say about gaming, though, um, I <clears throat> grew up playing uh, like the original Atari mm -hmm. and then grab graduated to the nintendo i think i had the nintendo when i was like six or seven and so the legend of zelda has got to be my all-time oh, favorite yeah. game um nothing will beat that game for me uh i absolutely love it i, I so i bought a gamecube mm -hmm. because my nintendo system no longer worked i bought a gamecube the year that they put out this like four game zelda disc it was like the first two Zelda's on Nintendo, the Super Nintendo, and then the I think the sixty four. Right. That's and, yeah. And yeah. um I do like a lot of retro gaming on here. That's like a big thing. It's like the retro vibes because I think it's just yeah. great. And a lot of people are into it now. It's that it's that retro thing. Um my first console I can remember was a Magnavox oh, console. Me. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was this big ass block with a keyboard on it. And it was just the one stick and the one button thing. I don't know how we got it, but my parents had it. And I was just like, okay, this is cool. It's just one stick and one button, but it was the greatest thing ever. I actually found a couple years back, I've got a Atari 2600 collection now. I've got about 50 games. I've got the original Atari, all the controllers, the whole case and all that. Like, I can't find a TV for it though. Oh, That's the God. worst part because you can't play the old consoles on new TVs. It it literally just doesn't work with HD TVs anymore. So I got to hook you up with a friend after this. All right. I have a system. It's about this big, mm -hmm. maybe a little smaller. It's HDMI. Nice. I have every single Nintendo, Super Nintendo, 64, Sega, Genesis, Game Boy, Neo Geo. Every, I have like... I want to say there's probably 2,000 titles on there. Nice. And a bunch of different uh, systems. And it is the fucking sickest. Every <laughs> single game for every system is on there. It's nice. amazing. That would be sick. Dude built it from scratch. Nice. Um, Do you think that gaming is like... Let me think here. The same as it was back in the day? Like pastime wise, or do you think people are taking gaming like way more seriously nowadays? Fuck, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty real because you get the headsets, man, and like you get the shit talking. And <laughs> I know when I was playing Madden, um, I would say like ten years ago, I, maybe ten years ago, I was playing online, maybe even a little longer. Mm. I started playing online, and I would get guys on there that like I, you know, there'd be ten seconds left, and I'd be winning the game, and then they they wouldn't let you finish the game because they were fucking sore losers yeah. and then they would type sh <laughs> then they would either talk shit or type shit in to like the message mm. like after the game and it's pretty fucking brutal um yeah i, I know I, call I mean, of duty I, was really bad for that too yeah and like. so I, I mean it, it probably still is you know i mean it, it is cool though because you can you know you can play your friend mm. you know just like i'm talking to you right now in in real time from probably halfway around the world, you know, and you get these groups of friends that like they do gaming and that's like their thing. They like, Hey, we're going to game at fucking 8 PM tonight for four hours. And this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. And you meet new people and you have a camaraderie. Um, that said, I would lose my fucking mind at like seven or eight years old, not being able to get past like a certain level on Mario brothers. Oh, or hundred uh percent. -huh. Like where you're just like <laughs> trying to fucking break the controller in half, but you know, you shouldn't cause you're not going to get a new one. 
I, I think my parents bought me a Super Nintendo back in the day. Was That was the first Nintendo I had. But yeah, like Super Mario World, that game was just... Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was really big into Game Boy, too. Like the original Game Boy, like Pokemon and stuff, when that was the oh, craze. For sure. I was for deep, sure. deep into that. And that has come back like absolutely insane. Pokemon is huge now. And like the yeah. car, the trading cards and everything, like there are fights in stores over cards now. Like it was back in the day. It's absolutely fucking crazy. So we, 18 visions, it had to have been like the early two thousands. We got on a game boy kick. And so we all got like these game boys mm-hmm. and we started like, we would, we would go into any time we would see a game stop. We'd fucking go in and we'd see what games they had and we'd all buy different games and we'd fucking just play each other's games. And it was a sick way to pass the time on a drive, oh, yeah. but yeah. Oh, speaking of, fun. I actually have, I have two things. I still have my OG oh, gray sick. brick and then I had this as well. This was really cool. This was for the Super Nintendo. And what you oh, did yeah. was you plugged your Game plugged Boy game in, in and played yep. on the TV. It was super sick. Yep. Yep. Had that one for sure. <laughs> Um, do you know of any common misconceptions that people have about you? Me as an individual? Yes. Oh, I mean, I don't really know. Uh, I would say in the early 2000s, uh, that I was gay, Hmm. (laughs) which, okay. (laughs) That's strange. Uh, I think think because I think because of my hair. Right. Uh, I painted my nails, wore a lot of pink. Um, I think that and, went around a lot with the whole emo scene yeah. for the most part. It was the guys were wearing tight clothes and yeah, yeah. it's crazy. And it's like, okay, uh, <laughs> that's fine. I don't really care. I, I work in a hair salon when I am <laughs> home from tour and um, yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I think that was part of it too, is that I did hair. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, does chat have any questions? Let me see. I know there was a few over here. Let me see. Um, is obsession ever going to be put on vinyl? Okay. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> we'll Maybe. just, we'll just let that one sit. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would love to, I have so many rad ideas for that one. I think that that one, is a possible gray area for us in terms of like who owns the rights to it. Oh, right. right yeah. That was a Sony. Mm. It was a trust kill release, but Sony had upstreamed the band to like red their distribution label red or something like that. So that, I'm not really sure what's the deal with that one. Right. Um, who is your favorite posi hardcore band? Favorite posse hardcore band? God. Uh, does Terror count? I would say they... so. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Or I'm trying to think back. I guess like going back even f- – well, I'll go back further. Like Gorilla Biscuits, you know? Like mm. that's – I mean that band like just it, – they'll sit with me forever, you know? I got into Terror later on like – what album? I think it was when Keepers of the Faith hit. That's when I really got into Terror. but. Yeah, they're so good. So yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Your top five favorite vinyls. Ooh. Uh, I have a Soundgarden Super Unknown on blue. Nice. Um, undertow at both ends on blue as well. That's on like a, like a marbled, like kind of like light to royal blue color uh, god that's a tough one <laughs> that's i'll tell you my favorite one that i i got rid of was uh earth crisis all out war mm-hmm. on blue vinyl mm-hmm. there was a photo like a like a kinko's like color cover mm-hmm. with like a live photo and it was hand numbered. Oh, I wow. think I had number 13 out of 25. Oh, geez. And I will never get that back. Well, you know, yeah, that's, that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be the, that's going to be the one, the one that got away. Um, <laughs> Unbroken on blue vinyl, uh, Life Love Regret. That's 
that's an all time for me. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of like a vinyl where I just love like the aesthetic of it, like the way that it looks. Um, do you think that has a lot to do with vinyl collecting? The look of the vinyl as well? I do, yeah. Like for me personally, I'm a fan of something that's a little bit more wild, mm -hmm. right? Like something that might have like a two color combo with some fucking crazy splatter in it, mm -hmm. right? Or something that is just like bright, like very like appealing to me visually, like a hot pink or like a neon color. Like the, like those those colors are are definitely uh, appealing to me. Um, for me, the stuff that's less appealing is just like just a standard like clear, transparent, or like a, just a solid like a red, like right. just a, a a solid like opaque red vinyl is very boring to me. Mm. Uh, let's see. Someone asked if there is any plans for anything with eighteen visions this year. Yeah, so we have uh, Furnace Fest mm -hmm. in Birmingham, Alabama. That's in late September. Uh, we are locked in on that. Nice. Uh, would love to do a couple more shows around the date, if possible. And then based on everyone's schedules and the status of our country and what things look like, uh, would love to play some more shows at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And would love to get some new music out as well. So... Yeah, we're constantly, constantly like Keith and I are working on music and just collaborating. Um, th that's one big thing, man. I feel like any band that has not taken the time of, you know, this pandemic to mm -hmm. work on music and get some ideas out there is just making a huge fucking mistake. I was going to ask about that. Um, a lot of people have said that, you know, it the pandemic has been terrible for a lot of people. But for a lot of people, it seems like the pandemic was the best time for them because they had time to focus on whatever their passion project is. Yeah. Would you say that the band has had a lot of time to focus on the music at that point, basically? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we got, you know, we got the EP out, uh, mm -hmm. the Inferno EP. Um, so, you know, we finished writing and recording that. Um and we're able to actually get like the physical product out there as well, hmm. which, uh, which we learned, uh, we did our second pressing of vanity and we had to wait months Ooh, for that to yeah. come in. So like the pre-orders were done and people were waiting months for this hmm. fucking record to come and they get shipped to us from the Czech Republic. So, oh wow, we were just like, you know, we had like no fucking answers for anybody. The pressing plant had no answers and it was pretty brutal. So the fact that we were able to kind of get things back to normal in terms of like speed and time and, mm. and, and getting things shipped out with Inferno was great. Um, but yeah, we, and, and even since then, we've still been just kind of churning out new ideas and new concepts. So it's been fun. Do you think touring will ever really get back to where it, was before or do you think there's always going to be some type of restrictions to it uh in terms of like uh whether or not you're vaccinated or have to wear a yeah, mask and like capacity a and all that yeah uh, you know i think it's just going to be a state by state i think we'll be 100 percent capacity mm. i do uh, i know that california is already like we're moving in the right direction um i think we're 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 doing a good job of getting the vaccine vaccine out there and and it's now like fully available to everyone over the age of 16. So uh, I'm not sure about the whole vaccine passport and getting into shows. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not opposed to that at all. Um, I know for me and myself, getting the vaccine was super important mm -hmm. in terms of like my, my daily life. Uh, I work one-on-one -on -one with clients in the salon. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to protect myself against them and for them, 100%. right? Uh, I want to be able to work out uh, without having to worry. Uh, I want to be able to attend family events that are going to have like multiple households involved, mm -hmm. which, you know, my wife and I have been passing on those, um, you know, getting together with groups of friends and not having to ask everyone what they've been doing or worrying about this and that, right, right. Uh, being able to go to shows, sporting events, uh, travel. I'm a huge traveler. 
Um, and then, you know, playing shows and being able to not restrict myself from interacting with fans and not have, having to worry about being in somebody's face at a show, which, you know, I just I love like the fan interaction or, you know, passing the mic out, you know, I'm, that was the first thing that went into my head. It's like, am I never going to be able to pass the mic? Like, you know, do like the mic grab out, right. you know, like, is that something that's going to be gone? And that's always been like the fucking funnest thing for me because I remember being a kid or a fan, you know, when I was, you know, in my younger years wanting to fucking get the mic so bad and just, you know, <laughs> scream into that shit. And like, that's part of like metal and hardcore and punk. And, you know, I, I don't ever want that to go away. And, and, and for me, knowing that like I'm, do, I've done my part, hoping everybody else has done their part uh, at the shows and, you know, that can still happen uh, as far as like touring uh, the only thing I can really see being different is maybe some of these, you know, some of these smaller bands, uh, might get kind of like knocked out of things, um, mm. just based on like finances and availability. I think at first it's going to be a big like fight for venues with tours and bands and, you know, just trying to get into these markets, uh, once everything opens back up. Yeah. Everybody's um, going to want to tour at once. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be, that's, that's going to be the hard part. And so for a band like us um, that doesn't tour, we usually just do, you know, three, four shows in a weekend, fly out and play. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what that will look like for us uh, moving forward. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be different. I think ticket prices will probably go up. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the nature of, right. of the beast, you know, the promoters and the, the, cons the purchasers of these concerts and tours are not going to want to lose their ass so they're going to want to be protected uh financially which is completely understandable mm. i mean these venues have just uh, you know they've just taken a fucking a beating yeah yeah um what do you think of the e-concerts that have been going on uh they're cool some of them can some of them are are, are cool some of them aren't as cool you know it right. just depends obviously the more money you put into it the better it's going to look mm. um uh, they're, they're all right. I'll, you know, I'll watch, I'll watch one. It's, I think for me, it's more or less, uh, it would be more or less keeping my attention throughout knowing that I'm not there. You right, know? right. Right. Is, can I sit through an hour to an hour and a half of the show where I'm not actually there mm. when, uh, but it's, you know, at the same time, it's real fucking easy to put on a fucking in excess show from right. you know, 1989, <laughs> you know, and watch the whole thing or a Metallica concert and it's like sick right right uh from back in the day but yeah it's uh yeah i think I, I think it's great for the bands i think it's great for the fans that that want it uh we had talked about doing it we just got to a point where it wasn't going to make sense for us to be able to do because we are self-funded to mm -hmm. be able to do what we wanted uh and and to give the type of show and and visual co uh, content uh without having to like really, really sacrifice the quality. Right, right, right. Um, I, Cause I saw the Madden brothers from Good Charlotte are actually trying to do a thing nationwide where there's venues all around the nation where if a band plays there, they can automatically stream their set and get revenue from the streams. Super cool. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I love that idea. I feel like embracing that is going to be an easier way to kind of transition back to the norm for a lot of these bands and for a lot of the venues and everything because like yeah like you like you said ticket prices are going to be out the astronomical at first because they have just, to be yeah they have to be there's no way to not yeah it's absolutely insane yeah i think too uh you know for us like one thing i also i was trying to get together was like a show right mm -hmm. at like say like chain reaction or another local venue uh, where, you know, we get like three or four bands packaged together. Each band gets like a 40 minute set or so. And it's just like, you know, cross promoted between these bands. I think that the real hurdle was our people going to want to sit through like three hours of like a show without actually being there. That's, that was the hurdle. And right. it's most likely not, you're going to want one band or the other and probably not going to want us to do the whole thing right that's i've I never thought about a festival an e festival that's a type situation i've never even never even put that one never put that thought out um 
what do you think about these festivals coming out so early like big festivals with a lot of people do you think that they're kind of going too fast into it or yeah i mean i don't necessarily agree Mm -hmm. with how some of the states have handled the situation in general right right of course you know um so there's that side of it uh the other side is you know you got open air right right and so it's supposed to be a little bit safer mm. uh i you know i don't know what the capacity uh, capacities are you know i would maybe I would tend to lean to hold off maybe a few more months. You know, I don't think Mm. like, I don't think there needs to be anything necessarily happening in like May, June, July. You know, I think, I think we still got like a little bit of ways to go for some herd immunity, but I think once, you know, once more of these vaccines start, you know, getting accepted by people and, you know, we get that. And I, I feel like, I feel like at least here where I live, most people that are going to punk metal or hardcore shows are going to want to be vaccinated, right? 100%, it's, yeah. I, it's, I think a lot of it's going to have to do with what's the genre, mm-hmm. right? Like what, like what's the genre, what's the fan base like, and like, are it, you know, is, you know, I, I not, I, I try not to generalize and I don't want to generalize, but like, I, I just know like the punk metal hardcore community is a little bit more left-leaning right Mm -hmm. so they're more inclined probably to get the vaccine and 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 be safer about things um so yeah i just think it it, it's all fucking situational based it's such a it's it's so sticky right 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 somebody brought up uh let's see what's i'll just read the whole comment if they don't start sooner or later then there won't be anything left venues and musicians are struggling as long as the people respect the rules and each other it should be fine that's true, but at the same time, not everyone's going to do that. Not everybody's going to respect it. People are are going stir crazy, and yeah. as soon as these big events open up and these people start getting a couple fucking drinks into their system, right. there's not going to be any social distancing. There's not going to be any worry of who's wearing a mask and who's not wearing a mask and all of that stuff. And I understand people are stir crazy and they really want to get out there, but if you go too fast, it's just going to revert and then we're going to have to wait even longer. Yeah. That's it's, the fear, right? Yeah. It's that's like the fear. patience. A lot of people just don't have any patience because it's been so long since any of this stuff has happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, it's just, it's, it's tough because, you know, it's up to us to hold ourselves accountable. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, it's just like you said, you get a couple drinks and that's, I think a, a big reason why, we had to do like a second lockdown here uh, in in Orange County because things opened up a little too quickly and bars opened up and people were going out and drinking and you get a couple of drinks in you, your inhibitions lower. The you know all of a sudden you're close talking to somebody and you know the the flow of activity and you know touching things and being able to sanitize things at a rate where people are touching things is just not like it's not there at all yeah yeah it's 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 just not um and yeah and and then people just not fucking giving a shit too yeah you know and like i i know people i have clients that straight up don't think it's real still they still don't think it's real because they don't know anybody that's had it that's that's ridiculous that that is their reasoning behind it and it's just like it just fucking blows my mind you know it's crazy and then there's the ones who all thought it was an election thing and it's just like yeah i try to stay out of politics in general for the most part because it's just like a lot of people don't really know what they're talking about half the time they'll see something pop up on like facebook or something and they'll instantly believe it as truth and like it's just ridiculous yeah I mean, look, if we, if, 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 if everybody knew everybody going to these shows were able to hold themselves accountable right. for three or four hours, then it wouldn't be a big deal. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just the, it's the accountability. Right. And you know, it's, you know, it's, it's tough, but uh, fuck, I mean, I, I want this I, I, more than anybody. And I, I don't even 
it's not what I do for a living. You know, it's, it's just purely for fun playing yeah, shows. Yeah, exactly. Right. But like, I, you know, I want to be able to go to a concert badly, mm. you know? It's like, so. I, I, I understand where both sides are coming from, though. Like, everybody's been locked up. They're impatient. They're going broke. They need the money. But it's like, yeah, sacrificing this extra couple of months that could completely get rid of it just to get a quick buck now, only to revert back and then lose all your money again. It just, it doesn't, I don't know. It's just, it's all, it's a fucking mess. <laughs> it yeah. really is. 100%. <laughs> Oh, there's a few people in chat that have said they had COVID. Their parents have died from COVID. That sucks. Yeah. That's yeah. that's absolutely terrible. terrible. I, I feel for them. I feel for them. Uh, I don't personally know anybody that's died. I know multiple people that have uh, have gotten it. I know multiple people that were in pretty bad shape. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had friends in the hospital. Um, it's fucking real. Um, yeah, it's fucking terrible. It's absolutely yeah. And I just, it really, it really, it bothers me. Like when it's, it really bothers me when it's downplayed, like a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I feel like this whole thing has shown a lot of people's true side. Yeah. hundred percent. Like it, it, this whole thing has, has taken a lot of masks off a lot of people. And yeah. I think it's probably for the better. Really? Yeah. I mean, dude, I can't tell you how many people like I have just purged from mm. my social media because I just don't want to fucking like, I just don't want to like see that. It's just fucking just some shit that people say is just infuriating. It is. You know? It really is. Do you, are you like a real avid social media person or do you try to like not no, scroll no. all day? Yeah, no, I don't scroll all day. Quite yeah. the opposite, actually. Right. Like, I'm I'm somebody that kind of goes on. I do this one, two, three. Fuck, cool. I'm done. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty much it. But unfortunately, I I feel like because a lot of this content that people are putting out has such high engagements, right? Right. That like I would like log into Facebook for a second. And because there's so many engagements on one person's post, it's at the fucking top of my feed. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's what I see. Right. Right. Um, so it's, it's more or less stuff like that than me actually just going through and like looking for it or just happening across it every 10 minutes. It's usually, it's like fucking boom, it's right there. So, right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, I'm not one to sit on my phone all day. There's just way too much other shit for me to do. So, right. Right. I, I try to stay off social media. Actually, like, I think it was in January. I took a whole week off, didn't touch it, didn't have it on my phone. That was great. But doing this, trying to advertise for, like, a Twitch stream and a podcast and everything, I almost have to just be linked into it, which yeah. it, it's like a double-edged sword in a way. I know, like, totally. a lot of bands are like that, too, because, you, I mean, you have to advertise your stuff. So it's like totally making the choice of when to cut it off. I think for me, uh, more than anything, I probably am on Twitter more because, and mm. which is like a fucking, just a fucking war zone, <laughs> like, right. <laughs> but I like, I, I have different like accounts that I, I seek out every day and it's usually for football content really. Mm. So like, I, I, I can seek those accounts out and like, I drown out all the other shit and don't have to see. And, uh, and but to be fair, most of my stuff is, uh, that I, that I would see on Twitter is probably, pro mask pro vaccine right uh, covid is fucking real right type shit yeah right that's that's a big thing like just trying to get down the right path on social media because you can just stray off and end up in some weird area and oh yeah yeah um what do you think about the whole uh like the cancel culture thing that's been going around lately oh man uh it is it's tough, dude. I mean, I know we've gotten real serious here, but <laughs> yeah, again, man, we need to like be held accountable. Right. Right. So I, I think like, fuck, it, it, it's just so tough because like, I want to listen to a band like lost profits. A hundred percent. Right. Uh -huh. But like, I can't ever listen to that band without... and not feel the, the back. Yeah. So same thing with Michael Jackson. Okay. Mm. And thankfully for his sake, he went before. Right. You know, 
the documentary came out and mm-hmm. it just stuff would be much harder to bury now. I oh, hundred like percent. Right. And I mean, I still feel like there's some fucking skeletons that could come out against him. You know, right. like what if Macaulay Culkin one day decides, I, I, I believe he just had a kid. Yeah. So what if one day he decides, Hey, you know what? Like I'm a parent now. Like I fucking, I realize what was going on. I covered up for him because I didn't understand, but being a parent now makes things different. And I have a new perspective. Like, right. I mean, you know, obviously MJ has gone, but like, I, I still hear his music on, it comes on in the salon, like all the time. And I can't help but think of that. And every time I hear him, so, you know, I, it's, it, the whole thing it, about it, separating the art from the artist, that's, yeah. I think that's one of the key things because it's tough. It is re- it's tough. Yeah. Because uh, I'll tell you what, man, the other dudes in Lost Profits are fucking solid dudes, uh-huh. solid, solid humans. And like, it's unfortunate. Like I, like, I just can't drown out the thought of like fucking Ian mm-hmm. when, you know, wanting to put on i mean i don't even put the music on because it just it can't it just can't be done right right um i mean there's there's certain things i feel like you know tim lambesis wasn't canceled completely right Right. so uh he did his time he's back out with his band uh i don't necessarily have a strong opinion one way or the other Mm -hmm. if i was a member of his band i probably wouldn't be in that band anymore right um but you know i feel like it's it's i i feel like it's up to us the individuals right. to make that 100%. decision for right. ourselves what do we want to you know what do we want to accept into our lives and what do we not you mm-hmm. know this person did x y and z he's a part of that band or he was in this film Mm-hmm. I'm not following his career anymore. I'm done with him. Right. Right. And so it's up to us to make those decisions as right. individuals, I think more, more than anything else. I can see that. That, that, that's probably the best way to look at it actually. Um, let's see. Does chat have any more questions? Let's see. Dun, 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 dun. I know we went down a really, <laughs> we went down a real serious path there towards the <laughs> end. <laughs> I don't, I don't usually get that deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I like, that's basically what I've been like, trying to do here is just like have conversations that people really aren't having or they don't see this maybe they don't see the side of you or they don't see the side of someone like sure it's kind of like my whole thing with this podcast is try to like give people something different because you definitely it's have. yeah because it's definitely like it's something like that does it sticks out more i would say because it's not like oh hey what did you do on your last album and the album before that and here's this thing i found on wikipedia let's talk about yeah. it yeah Oh, somebody asked what your favorite tattoo is. Oh, my favorite tattoo. Fuck. Um, God, man, it's got to be the the straight edge tattoo on my chest. So mm. I've had this since I was basically 15 years old. Um, and it's still just as important to me, if not more important to me now than it was then. Mm. That's probably my favorite one. Nice. Uh, let's see. Ask him his opinion versus all oh, studio versus home production. Oh, yeah. You know, it depends on what you're going for. Uh, Would I prefer to record live drums? 100%. uh, But given like our budget and not having a label and, you know, what goes into that for us right now uh, doesn't necessarily make sense. So home production, I think Keith uh, did a fucking incredible job with Inferno and from you know, everything that we've been doing the last few months, his skills are just getting better and better and better. So the stuff already sounds better than what was released, you know, Mm -hmm. late last year, um, which is just a fucking credit to him and how hard he works and how hard, how much he researches on, you know, the production side of things. Um, But yeah, I mean, fuck, if you are a band and you can do it on your own and you can kind of, you know, cut that cost that is, you know, usually pretty expensive. Um, and especially if you're just starting out, you know, on your own, I feel like the at home way is, is a good way. If if you can get a quality sound out of it. Do you, 
think that you can hear a difference anymore between digital instruments and real instruments? Uh, for drums, you can, I think. Uh, maybe maybe strings mm. as well. Uh, a- anything else, fuck, man. Like, it's just incredible what what everything sounds like and i would even say some drum tones you can get to sound like that are uh, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference mm. you know uh, i think for for me like i don't i guess i don't listen to i don't necessarily listen to a band's production and try to pick out oh i wonder if that's real i wonder if that's fake right you know i just know what is going on with ours mm. and then i know on another band's production what sounds good to me and what doesn't i'm not trying to say oh those guitars sound fucking muddy they must be fake or those drums don't sound as bright or as big they must be real right Mm -hmm. um you know or they're not like you know they're not sound replaced or or something or that bass tone sounds super fake Uh, i don't listen that way i just I, i listen for pure enjoyment and you know some productions are better than others for me do do you think that like the a raw album would sound better than like a really polished album? Like the old hardcore albums that you could tell were just like thrown together in a garage that just have like that flavor? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So so for me like uh, like I like the perfect example is listening to something like Earth Crisis All Out War mm-hmm. 7 inch which is fucking cool as shit. And then listening to something like Gamora Season Ends, mm. which is also cool as shit. Like, I'm going to put Gamora Season Ends on fucking 10 times out of 10 because it sounds better. Right. You know? Uh, but then when we talk about like a rawness, like the Foo Fighters. Oh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. They put out an album, uh, Wasting Light, came out like, fuck, 10, 11 years ago, I think, 12 years ago. Dude, that, that album has a fucking rawness to it, um, but it still sounds fucking incredible mm-hmm. but the production on it is, is is raw it sounds fucking killer um it, it sounds like you're at the show kind of uh, it just kind of has this edge to it and i think that's fucking cool so when you can get that element to to the recording to where it sounds fucking raw and real and like you're there and have it sound like 2020 mm-hmm. then you're fucking on to something someone said they made that album in his kitchen yeah, crazy. There it's insane. Yeah. I like I like albums when they do one take. Like there is you can tell that it hasn't been copied and pasted like they didn't take the first vocal for the chorus and copy and paste it like that feels more real to me, I guess. For sure. For sure. Yeah, I'm uh as a vocalist I'm about getting like the best takes, right? Like I want like my, like the best quality I can put out there right on a recording because it's there forever Mm -hmm. um that said i'm not the biggest copy and paste guy Mm -hmm. right i don't love it um it 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 has its like uses for sure but like even on a chorus maybe maybe i'll cop and paste the harmonies or the layers right maybe stuff that's just kind of in the back Right, right, but the fucking the main shit has to be like it's got to be real, it's got to be there, and it's got to it's got to be maybe slightly slightly different than the first chorus um, take, and that's a hard thing for me too. Is like sometimes I'm just so fucking when I've been singing something for a few, you know, a few sessions or a few passes, um, getting a few takes. Sometimes I just get so in the fucking pocket or in the zone Mm -hmm. that like, it's like identical to what I did the first time. Right. And like, so it's, 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 it's (laughs) tough to make the second one intentionally different. Right. Right. For me, at least sometimes. Right. Did you start with vocals or did you? Yeah. Yeah. As, as far as me as like a musician. musician. Yeah. 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 I never really played, uh, much of an instrument, uh, I could pick up a guitar and jack around a little bit, right. uh, but I, I would say singing is is my strong point, and then like having an ear for 
what would sound good here um, or there. Uh, when I was doing Burn Halo, I did a lot of like the, I would, I would, I guess I would call it like assistant producing to the producer in terms of like getting a guitar, getting the guitar player to like write his solo a certain way. Mm. Like, no, choose this note, choose that note, like play it this way. Right. So I have an ear for musical things. I just am not good at putting them down myself. <laughs> Let's see. Someone asked, what's your process in a band being like over lockdown? Uh, like someone sends you a riff to sing over and then add drums to it. Like, are you guys doing it that way? How are you demoing? Like, yeah. So basically, uh, to answer your question, Keith, uh, Keith or Josh, uh, will, so the way it kind of works is Josh will write something and send it to Keith and then Keith will kind of prepare it, uh, for me. Hmm. Uh, and then Keith, same thing with his own compositions, his own songs. He will, prepare those fully guitar bass drums send them to me uh i dump them into so he'll use logic for that i'll dump them into garage band mm. i'll work on those songs at home uh through garage band i'll bounce them down i'll send them back to him get his opinion see if he wants any changes my demos are usually really really rough i try not to get too elaborate with with them i just kind of want like the 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 main ideas down um and then once uh, once we're clear, then we'll take it in and we'll start production on it. Nice. All right. Well, I think that might be it. Cool. Um, again, I appreciate you being here. I really do. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> Honestly, like, I don't know if I, I probably didn't show you. I have the 18 Visions oh, logo fuck, tattooed cool, on man. my thumbs. Like, it's that's cool been one of the bands from like my child like i guess you would say childhood my teenage years that i followed all the way through that's influenced me into who i am now so it's like this is awesome oh, i appreciate thank you it so much <laughs> yeah, absolutely my pleasure uh all right well thanks for being here i appreciate it um yeah awesome all right cool <laughs> <laughs> all right see ya